So this has nothing to do with my talk, but does anyone know JoJo's Bizarre Adventure? Yes! Okay, so um, I had a job interview a few weeks ago, and someone told me about that power pose thing, like right before, and I didn't realize that it was like a specific pose. I thought it was just like any pose that is like powerful. So I was like in the bathroom doing like JoJo poses. Um, I did not get that job. Um, they are not. Slow your roll, slides. Okay, so this seemed like a really good idea last night. Um, that's Dick Van Dyke. It's a very funny joke. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so it's like a really great time for queerness in games, right? Um, so we've got things like QGCon, which happens at Berkeley. It's in its third year this year, I think. Uh, Gamer X, which I think is also in its third year, which is super cool. Um, lots of like mainstream titles with queer games or with queer characters, like um, Gone Home, uh, Last of Us, like, wow, that's really cool, right? That's pretty awesome. Um, and there's also more attention being paid to like independent queer developers. So that game in the bottom right is called Consentical. It's by my friend Naomi Clark, um, and it's about human alien sex, and it's super cool. Um, so I think while we celebrate these games, it's also worth remembering that like shorthand umbrella terms like queer or like LGBT can obscure a really huge range of diverse experiences. Um, and that's even before we start considering like class and race and things like that, right? Um, so I think this happens in lots of contexts. Like we get these useful umbrella terms that like really help a bunch of people recognize that they have a shared experience. But what could sometimes happen is that they start to sort of like obscure the internal group difference. So you run into things like um, you have like the umbrella term of like trans, but like within that there's like different kinds of experiences, there's trans misogyny. Um, within like the category of people of color, there's like anti-blackness that operates within that sometimes. So these terms can be really useful, but they also make it hard to talk about within group variants. Um, so in games, I think like queer organizations and movements have made a lot of strides alongside women in games projects over the last few years. But today I wanna go beyond those kind of two really broad categories and talk about a group of people at their intersection, and this is where we come back to the title. Not Dick Van Dyke, but, um, but Dykes. Uh, so we know that the field of video games is like still profoundly sexist and homophobic, but we don't really often talk about how those dynamics interact. And also when we do, we often only talk about it in terms of like direct harassment. Like, okay, we know that it sucks to be on Twitter. Like, we know that like they who shall not be named are like still around and like still really horrible to people. Um, if you say their name, they appear, they're like Voldemort. <laughs> I'm not lying, it's happened to me before. So basically I wanna ask like what it means to be a lesbian in games today. Okay, so uh, the first issue that I wanna talk about is implicit exclusion from queer and women's advocacy projects. So this is an image from GamerX and I put this up not to pick on them because they've made some like really great changes over the last couple of years. And I think this honestly just reflects like, I think the gender composition of GamerX reflects more just like, it's the same as like most games events, right? There is a lot of dudes. Um, but uh, if you are a real life lesbian, it can be hard to like find a place in these kinds of events. So I wanna do an experiment really quickly. Um, I guess other than Gone Home and The Last of Us, can anyone name like a lesbian character in a video game? Yeah, in the back. Okay, there's a Dragon Age character, yes. I will take you on faith because I have not played it, but that seems like something they would do. Um, any others? Yeah. There were a bunch of uh, queer characters whose names I've forgotten in the Borderlands 2. Oh, okay, cool, yeah, um, awesome, yeah. Okay, so there's a character in the new Witcher game. Okay, yeah, back. Oh yeah, Life is Strange, that new game. Yeah, there's two, it's about two lesbians. Okay, um, so next question. Um, can you name a lesbian game designer? Naomi Clark does not count if you're gonna say Naomi Clark. Yes. Okay, Christine Love. Okay, great, awesome, local developer. Okay, cool, tabletop designer. Yeah. Okay, Porpentine. Okay, y'all are awesome. I bet if I asked that question at any other games event, they would just be like, um, but still, more, more characters than like actual people, right? Um, so as like a real life person, and I think this is sometimes, this speaks to a broader problem with like the focus on media studies in like games act, um, activism, but it feels like people are more invested in like 
seeing a lesbian in a game than like actually supporting a real person sometimes, um, which kind of sucks, right? And when it gets to the point where we're like, oh man, this game with lesbians is awesome. Oh, who made it? Oh, some straight guy. Um, it's like, <laughs> cool. Also, like, are we going to support actual like lesbian dubs? Um, so there's this focus on, focus on representations of gay women rather than women like themselves working in games. And that contributes to the second issue. And my slides stopped advancing. Good slides. OK. Um, yeah, so this is, I have to include at least one meme. I'm like contractually obligated. Um, so that's Lucina from Fire Emblem. And on the right is a photo from Code Liberation, which is like this great New York organization. And um, I say this not to like say that it's not like OK to be invested in like women characters in games, but just to say like it feels sometimes like our total interest is like in this stuff and like this stuff, which seems like less sexy and like less shareable online, is like not really um, as focused on. OK, so number two, uh, economic insecurity driven by heteropatriarchy. Wow, that is like a $5 word. Um, OK. <laughs> But I, I'm guessing most people in this room are like pretty comfortable with it, but like just put two and two together, right? Patriarchy, heterosexism, an awful sandwich, two great tastes that taste horrible together. Um, <laughs> I guess they're not great tastes individually either, but. So obviously sexism still bars many women from good jobs in video games, and this can operate through a lot of means, right? So it can be early dissuasion from pursuing tech skills to like interpersonal sexism and hiring decisions and to women just avoiding the notoriously misogynistic field of games. Like, I know a lot of women who have just been like, all right, y'all, I'm done. Like, <laughs> like, not, like, you win, but like, I, this isn't worth it to me anymore. Um, and that's totally real. Also, lesbians face additional workplace discrimination. Um, but there's also a specific kind of economic insecurity in that lesbians lack indirect access to well-paying jobs through marriage. Um, and so this is really complicated and fraught, right? Um, but one of the privileges of heterosexuality is that women in relationships with men have access to a greater earning potential than two women living together. Um, so most lesbians working in and around games don't have a partner with a high paying industry job um, or access to the kinds of indie success that is still mostly reserved for men. Okay, so let's say you push past all that stuff. You're like, I don't care, I'm like still doing this, awesome. Okay, great. Um, I hope you are stoked for your work to only be covered in articles on queer games. Um, so basically, you face a real barrier in how your work is discussed by critics. So I want to say uh, an author named Sarah Shulman right now, um, who is this like amazing activist and writer uh, based in New York, and she wrote this book called Stage Struck in the 90s, which is basically about how the musical Rent was stolen from her um, by a straight man who um, created this like huge empire around it, and well, he didn't directly, but it was created around it. Um, and basically gay life was stolen and sold back to straight people in this really distorted way. Um, you should totally read it if you're interested in any of that. Um, so uh, Sarah Shulman talks about what it was like to be a lesbian playwright in like the 80s, and I want to just quote her really quick. She says, when they finally did start to review our work, it was in a contained way, in that we would only be compared to one another. We were never positioned as part of the larger culture. The result of this kind of containment was brutal on our psyches because our closest friends and greatest supporters became our worst competitors. Only one of us, or one clique, or one aesthetic sensibility could have any credibility. When I read that a few weeks ago, I was just like, oh my god, this is happening again. Um, this didn't, never stopped happening. Um, like, this is what it's like to be a lesbian author in games, is like, your work is either going to be ignored or talked about in relation to other people doing similar things, so you're always sort of in implicit competition with them for attention. Um, and I think in general, games media is only interested in marginalized people insofar as they conform exactly to the mainstream standards of like what is acceptable, um, and they don't like push an agenda, or if they like are willing to perform their marginalization in a way that is like understandable to mainstream audiences. Okay. So finally, I want to talk about lack of mentorship. Um, so that's Sarah Shulman. Um, and I want to quote her again, because she talks about this uh, with regards to the theater world in the 80s. Um, she said that the problem with being dependent on gay male critics, who are the ones that were like mainly reviewing lesbian plays at the time, um, or terrifically encouraging straight women, is that they cannot serve as the kind of per personal network of mentors behind the scenes for us that men will for other men. Thus, we can't build the networks of power and support or make the connections upon which viable careers depend because there are so few people with power to connect with. 
there's no one to mentor us. So obviously to an extent, like all women in games are excluded from the informal networks that benefit men, but lesbians have it especially hard and we've sort of had to create these informal horizontal networks of support because there are basically no lesbians in like real positions of power or if there are, they don't really talk about it too often or extend mentorship. And without the support, uh, work is covered less, uh, economic security continues, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's like this horrible cycle. Um, wow, that's really depressing. <laughs> I've painted a horrible word picture for you. Um, so I wanna just talk about real quick, how much time do I have left? I'm just like hammering through it. Yeah, we're just like, we're gonna get through this together as a family. Um, okay, so I wanna talk about some ways that we can move forward and like hopefully think about some of these issues and um, make games a better place. Um, so the first one is um, resist the umbrellization of queerness. Umbrellization is almost definitely not a word. Um, <laughs> it's, it's underlined in my, like, in my notes here. It's like, no, that is not right. Um, but also, like, spell check doesn't think heteronormative is a word, so, like, fuck them. Um, so what I mean by this is, like, Umbrella terms are super useful, right? They're, they're great in a lot of cases, but we shouldn't reify them, by which I mean treat them as if they're like real, independent of like the meaning we give them. Um, so I think we should probe how we use terms like queer in games and dig deeper into complexity. Uh, otherwise what happens is like this basically, right? Like, hey, this umbrella's great now, but I'm getting really wet standing out on the edge here. Could I hold it for a bit? Uh, you're being like really divisive right now and like I wish you like would just like stop and just like let me hold the umbrella Does it really matter like who's holding the umbrella like come on? Um, so does this sort of make sense this idea of like yeah umbrellas are great We're all included but like who is sort of like holding the umbrella right and who's like out on the edge like getting like water dripping on their head um, that is actually a pretty good metaphor. I'm surprised I haven't run into that before. Um, okay, so the second thing is advocate for structural change and actual like living, breathing people. So I think we need more support, and I think this goes beyond just the issue of like queer women. Is like we need to make like labor activism sexy. <laughs> like um, media studies is like really popular right now. So like Anita Sarkeesian, like a lot of other folks like that are doing really important work, but I think the danger there is that we become so invested in like representations and we sort of forget like that actual people are creating those things and like those people have like politics and identities and lives. Um, and so things like fan events also are around gender and sexuality are really important, right? Like, Fan communities are really transformative and they do really cool things, but they're not the whole picture. Um, and I worry sometimes that we have this overvaluation of representation. And this is why local organizations like Games Making Games and uh, Pixels in Montreal are so important. They're not really like flashy or like, they don't really get the same kind of like currency online because they're not like an image macro that you can share to show like what sexism in video games looks like, right? Um, they're sort of like work that takes a long time that is like invested in like building the skills of participants. Um, and I think that stuff is ultimately more impactful. Like it's really easy to bite into the idea that we're fighting this like war on social media and like we're gonna win by posting the right memes or like videos or whatever. Um, but I don't think that's true, right? Like that doesn't ultimately affect people's lives on the ground in the same way as like training programs or like mentorship or like workshops. Um, and I think ironically, projects like DMG, which target like a really broad range of people, are more likely to be helpful to like actual lesbians working in games than projects that are specifically aimed at like lesbian representation. Because like, okay, Life is Strange, like cool, awesome. Like I'm super stoked that that game exists. Um, but it doesn't like do much for like a lot of people that I know, right? Um, as much as like a DMG like training program does or like a community based around a physical space does. So um, in light of that, um, I'm not just gonna like leave you hanging with like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll just like, lesbian game designer on Google, that's gonna work. Um, it does not work because I tried it when I was looking for a list of people. Um, so just like four people up there, some other folks named some other people that you might wanna look into. Um, AVB, Eva Problems. I don't know how to pronounce her name, I really should have asked, I've met her before, this is really embarrassing. Um, uh, and Maya Violet. Um, those are all people who are working in games, um, doing cool things. Um, some of them are doing more criticism work, some of them are doing like more game dev. I think they're all like doing design work right now though. So please check them out. Uh, check out, like please like make an effort to like support um, marginalized creators in general and like don't let your investment in activism around games be limited to representation. All right.